thought that um, pessimism was an indulgence, um, despair an insult to the imagination, uh, orthodoxy the kind of enemy of invention. My, my father used to always say to do what was necessary and then only ask that later if it was possible or even permissible. He loved that story of Jim Whitaker, the first American to climb Everest, and he used to always quote Jim who said that if you're not living on the edge when you're young, you're taking up too much space. Uh, he always said you, the big lesson of all the sages of the world was if you jump off the cliff, you don't land on rocks, you land on a feather bed. The world exists not to beat you down, but to lift you up. He, he was very much an eternal optimist. And as we've reflected on here, optimism is in somewhat short supply these days. We live in challenging times, the specter of climate change, the COVID crisis, the war in Ukraine. But truth be told, no generation's ever been born into a world free of troubles. Uh, my grandfather and my father generations, of course, fought in two global wars, endured the Great Depression. My grandfather was a surgeon on the Western Front for four years and four months. That meant that in the wake of battles, he would walk out on his shift at a casualty clearing station with one other surgeon and sometimes be surrounded by six acres of dying boys, and he'd have to decide who would live and who would be condemned to die. My own father was um, broken by Hitler's war. It was only in the wake of his death that we found a package of letters from my grandfather to the Canadian authorities in London during the war seeking the whereabouts of their wayward son, and the letters came back from the authorities. We don't think he's a drug addict. We, we don't think he's schizophrenic. We hear he's with the actors in the West End. Clearly, something had shattered him. And, and even our, our generation, many of us here, grew up in a decade marked by assassinations um, with the prospect of nuclear war, uh, riots in the cities, an endless war in Vietnam, and so on. But, you know, we also grew up to endure two glorious events that will be spoken about 10,000 years hence. Uh, it's Christmas Eve, 1968, you'll remember Apollo going around the dark side of the moon to emerge to see for the first time in human history, not a sunrise or a moonrise, but the Earth itself ascendant, a, a fragile blue planet, as the astronauts famously said, floating in the velvet void of space. And like some great wave of hope, the energy of illumination swept everywhere and everything began to change. You know, when we were kids, just getting people to stop throwing garbage out of a car window was a great environmental victory. Nobody spoke about the biosphere or biodiversity. Now those terms are part of the vocabulary of school children. Like, a, like you know, in this incredible transformation, in little more than a generation, women went from the kitchen to the boardroom, people of color from the woodshed to the White House, gay men and women from the closet to the altar. I mean, what's not to love? about a world capable of such scientific brilliance and such a cultural capacity for transformation and change. And let me share one other revelation of science, perhaps even more significant. And in many ways, it's the moonshot of our children's generation. And this too took part um, during a long voyage, but not in the space, but in the very fiber of our beings. And indeed, nothing that's happened in our lifetimes has done more to liberate humanity from the petty hatreds and tyrannies that have haunted us since the dawn of awareness. Science in our lifetime has, in fact, affirmed the intuitions of all the poets and saints and wise men and women through the ages who have perceived humanity to be one single interconnected whole. The genetic endowment of humanity is, in fact, a continuum. Biologically speaking, race is an utter fiction. We are all cut from the same genetic cloth. We're all descendants of the same children of Africa, including those who walked out of the ancient continent 65,000 years ago and then embarked on this extraordinary hegira, a diaspora of 40,000 years in duration, 2,500 human generations that carried the human spirit to every corner of the habitable world. Science has affirmed the essential interconnectedness of all humans, and that's an extraordinary thing. And what it means, of course, from an anthropological point of view is that the other peoples of the world aren't failed attempts at being us. 
They're not failed attempts at being modern. Every culture, by definition, is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And when the peoples of the world answer that question, they do so in the 7,000 different voices of humanity. And those answers, of course, become our human repertoire for dealing with the challenges that will confront us as a species in the coming centuries. Every culture has something to say. Each deserves to be heard, just as none has monopoly on the route to the divine. Well, my father wasn't by any means a religious man, but he used to say that there's good and evil in the world. Uh, take your side, son, and get on with it. And there was really great wisdom in this. You know, we have this idea in the Christian tradition, this, this really delusion that the fallen archangel, who of course is the devil and the Christ child, who symbolizes the good, will somehow at one point do this great battle in which the, the good will, will win and evil be, will be reduced. Ain't going to happen. You know, in the 17th century, back into the 12th century, if you ask the obvious question in Europe, if God's all-powerful, why does he allow evil to exist in the universe? If you ask that question, you'd be burned at the stake for heresy. But when Lord Krishna, in a very different cultural context, was asked that very question, uh, why, if God's all-powerful, does he allow evil to exist in the universe? Lord Krishna said, to thicken the plot. In other words, good and evil always march side by side. And our job, as Alexandra said, is to put our shoulders uh, into the wheel of, of justice, knowing always, as Martin Luther King said, that the arc of history ultimately bends towards the righteous and the good. And that's, in a way, what it's all about, you know, coming together, uh, a single people, a single species, and leaning into the right side of history, pushing the wheel of life forward for the benefit of all. That's the model. And I think that's what the Buddhists talk about when they say all life is suffering. They, they don't believe in good and evil. The path of the pilgrim is not toward a destination, but toward a state of mind, a liberation of the jewel of a, a essence that lies within every human being. And oddly enough, one way that I came to understand some of this was when I finally was able to distinguish religion from the essence of the sacred. I mean, I think that's something we all go through all the time. As a little boy, I prayed every night. I can still see myself, hands together, elbows on the windowsill, wide open to the winter night air in Montreal, looking through the stars that shone through the branches of the elm trees that then still thrived in the old neighborhoods of Quebec. And I, I conversed with a God whose presence could be felt and whose spiritual authority and omnipotence I accepted as a little boy as an act of faith. My parents, both of them broken by the war, uh, rarely, if ever, saw the inside of a church. So curious as it may sound, from the age of four and five, I began to take myself off dutifully every Sunday on my own, and I continued to do so without fail every Sunday for six years. I still have the little gold badge with the silver cross and the white enamel that rewarded my attendance record. And like a pilgrim at the gates of a great cathedral, I didn't go to church to worship the building. I went there to be in the presence of God. And for the longest time, um, he always turned up. He was always to be found. But as the Years, of course, as they do for so many of us, went by, and I learned more and more about the nature of the world. There came a day when he, he simply failed to show, and I never again entered a church as a Christian believer. But when years later I returned um, to that small community as an adult, what astonished me most was to realize how small my universe had been and how intimately I I, I had known it. You know, every blade of grass resonated with a story. Shadows marked the ground where trees had fallen in my absence. New construction I took as personal insults to something that lay at the confluence of landscape and memory. And what I realized when I returned is what, and what I felt so powerfully in those moments of return was not nostalgia but rather a connection to the actual force that for all those years 
had propelled my youthful spiritual yearning, a kind of numinous energy that I now recognize as being the essence of the sacred, a kind of supersensory dimension that transcends religion that I now know to be the essence of the sacred, the kind of the invisible presence that the French philosopher Henri Corbin described as the imaginal, this sort of supersensory dimension, as I say, that transcends religion, a kind of space of intuition and revelation impossible to describe, but accessible to those in every culture who perceive the world, as Corbin wrote, through the eyes of the heart. And I realized that my longings as a child had not really been of a religious nature, at least not in a formal sense. I'd been looking for a path that embraced the mystic amongst the multitudes, the promise of all people through all time in all places who have found peace and comfort in the pursuit of the divine. I came to see God as but a product of our desires, our spiritual uh, um, yearning, our imagination transforms an edifice of stone into a sacred space. A shrine is sanctified by the legacy of all who have come before with their hopes and fears, promises and prayers. Relics, icons, chalices and crosses, all simple objects carved from wood, silver, bone, take on spiritual resonance only over time like old tools warm from decades of human touch. Sacrifice from Latin means to make sacred. And if the idea of the sacred is as old as humanity itself, as anthropologist Roy Rappaport suggests, then the sacred can never be divorced from human agency. We dream it into being. Ritual is the ground from which it springs. The sacred only becomes manifest through the enactment of rituals that summon the spirit and give form to the divine. In Jerusalem, for example, as a Jewish people water the Western wall with their tears and melt the stone with their kisses, they achieve spiritual clarity and purpose as God's eternal nation, his chosen people. In the mountains of central Haiti, there is a waterfall called Sodo that is the home of Dambalewedo, the serpent deity of Dahomey, the source of the falling waters, the repository of all spiritual wisdom. And as the waterfall fell, it reflected a rainbow, Aedawedo, and their love entwined them in a cosmic helix from which all of creation was forged. And so once each year in July, tens of thousands of voodoo acolytes make their way to the sacred waterfall. Some simply slip into the narrow pools, but for most it is to move behind the cold, thin veil of the divine and merely to embrace the water is to become possessed by the serpent deity. And at any one point in time, you literally have hundreds of acolytes taken by the spirit slithering across the stones like serpents. This man here has gone into the waterfall fully clothed to allow the force of the water to tear his rags from his body so that like the snake that sheds its skin to become renewed, he too will become renewed for the coming year. For most of the year, the mountain valley in the Andes of southern Peru, known as the Sinicara, is home only to solitary shepherds and their flocks. But for three days from the Feast of the Ascension in Corpus Christi, as the Pleiades reemerge in the sky, as many as 50,000 pilgrims from all over the southern Andes converge at the base of the mountain for a ceremony known as the Coyariti, the Star Snow, Snow Festival. Some arrive on foot, others on mute by mule, others in open trucks and buses. Some who are crippled crawl up the mountain on blocks of wood, and they move up a trail that rises in seven miles, a trail that's marked by altars and cairns, the stations of the cross where each pilgrim drops a black stone to lift off the burden of sin from their bodies. And it falls upon the ritual specialists, the pablitos, to perform the most dangerous and formidable and solemn act of the coeriti. And like Christ himself, they must carry 
the terrible burden. They carry the crosses from their village churches up the flanks of the Kurkapunka Glacier, where they implant in the snow the crosses to be charged by Pachamama over the course of the next 48 hours, all of it in the shadow of the sacred mountain, Ausangati, the most sacred mountain of the Incas. They are wrapped together by whips to recall the torment of Christ. And as the sun comes down, the uh, comes up in the following uh, second morning, the crosses come down to be carried back to their communities, along with small blocks of ice to regenerate those elders who are unable to make the journey to bring fertility to the fields and well-being to the families, health to the animals. And so this notion of pilgrimage through sacred geography, homage to the gods, becomes in effect uh, a collective prayer for the cultural survival of the entire Pan-Andean world. Well, if we go around the world to Australia, the most parsimonious of continents, we'll remember that the first humans to arrive there did so over 65,000 years ago. These were the, we know genetically that these were the very first people to walk out of Africa. And in studying speed, they crossed 5,000 miles, the underbelly of Asia, and then they somehow found their way to the, 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 the homeland of Australia. And when they arrived, the ancestors went walking. And along the song lines, they sang creation into being. And the song lines recall that ancestral journey just as they recall the body of the rainbow serpent. And so today, as the Aborigine, Aboriginal people retrace these movements along the song lines, they chant the, 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 the songs of the first dawning. They enter the dream time. And the dream time is not a dream. Um, nor is it the measure of the passage of time. It is the very realm of the ancestors, uh, a parallel universe where the ordinary laws of time, space, and motion do not apply, where past, future, and present merge into one. In all of the 10,000 clan territories of Australia, there was not one that had a word in their language for time or for past, present, or, and future. And critically, to walk the song lines is to become part of the ongoing creation of the world, a place that both exists and is eternally being formed. Thus, the Aboriginal people see themselves not merely as being attached to the earth, but absolutely essential to its existence. Without the land, they would die, but without the people, the earth would wither. And should the rituals stop, uh, the voices fall silent, all would be lost because everything on earth is held together um, by the song lines, just as everything is subordinate to the dreaming, which is constant but ever-changing. Every landmark is wedded to a memory of its origins and yet always in the process of being born. Every animal and object resonates with the pulse of an ancient event while still being dreamt into being. And so the land is encoded with everything that has ever been, everything that ever will be, in every dimension of reality. And the world is perceived to be a place that is perfect, though constantly being reimagined and renewed. And so to walk and honor the song lines, to walk at all as a human being in this lifetime, is in fact to engage in a constant act of affirmation an endless dance of creation. Well, all of India, as many of you know, is one vast mandala of the sacred. You know, the British have this incredible conceit that India didn't exist as a concept until the arrival of the postal service and the trains and the, and the, the British bureaucratic uh, imposition of the civil service. Nothing could be further from the truth. What holds India together is movement through sacred geography, pilgrimage. This is the essence of India as a concept, as a spiritual home. For 2,000 years, the landscape of the entire continent has been defined and given meaning by the power of myth, narrative, and above all, pilgrimage. On any day, as you all know, in India, there are literally tens of millions of people 
on the move, making their way step by step through a living landscape of mountains, rivers, and forests, and villages, all elaborately linked to the legends of the Hindu gods. Every place has its story, and every story has its place. And what the pilgrims ultimately seek are points of illumination, a little bit like what the Irish call the thin places, you know, places on the landscape where heaven and earth come together to, 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 to reveal glimpses of the divine. Uh, sacred destinations in India known as tirthas, which are fords or crossings charged with power and purity, where, again, heaven and earth come together sometimes to meet, allowing the devotee to cross over the river of samsara and reach the far shore of liberation. India is a land of over 10,000 tirthas, 10,000 geographical points that are seen as portals to the divine. That is the matrix that makes India what it is. Well, we slip quickly into the Amazon, the most profound cultural insight of the Barasana and the Makuna, the people of the Anaconda, who believe that they came up a milk river from the east in the belly of the sacred serpent, the people who incidentally, as I mentioned here once before, do not cognitively color, distinguish the color blue from the color green because the canopy of the forest is equated to the canopy of, of the of, of the of the of the heavens, their most profound cultural intuition is the notion that plants and animals are but people in another dimension of reality. Mythology infuses land and life with meaning. Uh, there is no separation between nature and culture. Without the forest and the rivers, humans would perish. But without people, the natural world would have no order or meaning. All would be chaos. And maintaining the flow of generative energy, um, fomenting reciprocity before, between all forms of life, is the duty of the shaman who, despite what many report, is neither priest nor physician. He is much more like a diplomat in constant dialogue with the spirit realm. He must have the tools of a nuclear engineer who periodically will go to the very heart of the reactor to reprogram the world. The shaman moves with ease through mystical realms unseen by ordinary eyes, but familiar to the Barasana and the Makuna who say that they see with their minds. And this accounts for the use of yahe in rituals that embrace the entire community where the men come together uh, taking this powerful potion, which becomes a portal to the divine. And so as they don the ritual regalia, the yellow corona of pure thought, the white egret plumes of the rain, they literally, not, they're not symbols of the ancestors, they actually become the ancestors and move through sacred space, alighting on all the sacred sites, transforming and transcending every form, becoming as if a single pulse of pure energy flowing through all creation. Well, we were talking this morning about the mamos of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. I was with the mamos just 10 days ago. Um, and here is an extraordinary cluster of cultures, all descendants of the ancient Tyrona civilization in a bloodstained continent. These people have never been conquered by the Spaniards. They, st they remain ruled by a ritual priesthood, but the training for the priesthood is extraordinary. They're, they're descendants of the ancient Tyrona civilization. In the wake of the conquest, they escaped into the isolated uh, reaches of the, of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, this volcanic massif that soars to 20,000 vertical feet off the Caribbean coastal plain of Colombia, the highest coastal mountain range on Earth. And in the hidden reaches of those mountains, over three centuries, they reinvented their culture as a devo devotional civilization of peace. The mamos and the training for the mamos involves uh, austerities in the extreme. The young acolytes are taken away from their families by divination at the age of two and three, sequestered in a kind of shadowy world of darkness uh, for 18 years, uh, during which time they have a special diet. They can leave the hut, but they can never leave the environs of the hut. They do not see a landscape. Do not, they do not see a sunrise. And during all this time, they are enculturated in the idea that their prayers and rituals literally maintain the cosmic, or we might say ecological, balance of the world. And after this extraordinary time in isolation, 
the acolytes are taken out for what is called a journey to the heart of the world. And led by the priest who has trained them, they embark on a journey from the, from the sacred temple to the ice, from the ice back to the sea, and from the sea back to the temple. And all the time, as they're beholding for the first time in their lives, at the age of 20, the wonder of a world that we take for granted, the priest who has trained them sits back and says, you see, it's, as I promised you, it really is this beautiful, and it's yours to protect. And it's astonishing to think that this civilization has survived not two hours by air from Miami Beach. And indeed, the sun priests of the Arawako and the Kogi and the Wiwa look down from the heights on the very beaches where Columbus's men landed on the third voyage. 500 years after the conquest, and they are still here to um, inform us of another way of being. Now, each, in a sense, of these stories, um, and th this incidentally is Mamo Camilo, who I'm working with now on a new book, and uh, I just was with him in this place where this photograph was taken, and he he said, said something to me very powerful that I was able to pass on to President Juan Manuel Santos before President Santos left office. He said to me, in, thinking of the Colombian War, he said, uh, La paz no vale nada si es solamente una manera en que los varios lados pueden unificarse para mantener una guerra contra la naturaleza. Tenemos que hacer paz con todo el mundo natural. So what he's saying is that peace won't matter anything if it's just an excuse for the three sides to come together to maintain a war against nature. It's time to make peace with the entire natural world. Well, each of these stories, if you will, these kind of cultural anecdotes, um, are, is rooted in place, the product of a particular way of thinking, a unique vision of life itself. But they all express a common impulse, a fundamental transcendent, ubiquitous, universal human desire to engage not death, but life as it is, the invisible forces that lie all around us, the realm, if you will, of the imaginal in the here and now. Death, of course, is the great mystery. It's the edge beyond which life as we know it ends and wonder begins, and how a civilization rationalizes that inexorable separation inevitably determines its metaphysical or its re religious worldview. Stripped to the bone, every uh, religious, most religious longings, at least in traditions, come down to a simple desire to wrestle with eternity and come out on top. But the pursuit and the embrace of the sacred, by complete contrast, has absolutely nothing to do with death. It's all about life. The sacred is eternal, reaching far into the past, shining as a beacon to the future. It is everywhere and nowhere. What is sacred can never be diluted or compromised, co-opted or copied, commodified or made sordid through commerce and greed, sensed if never seen, elusive and mysterious by its very nature, the sacred may lie just beyond our reach, yet there is comfort in knowing um, that such a radiant presence may one day be encountered. The clock is not ticking. No force exists that can rob us of the promise of the sacred. The traveler today walks the same spiritual ground as a pilgrim of old. Freya Stark crossed the desert in search of lands and peoples, she wrote, where the miraculous is not yet separated from everyday life. Patrick Lee Fremore witnessed the efficacy of prayer while living in a remote ben Benedictine monastery perched on a rocky summit in Greece, not far from here. It had little to do with religion, he concluded. Prayer's power to heal was a product of desire. The anthropologist Clifford Gertz wrote, no matter how often we declare sacred experiences to be unverifiable, it does not stop people everywhere from continuing to have them. So when I was that little boy and still in the thrall of my Christian faith, my father, <clears throat> without in any way being unkind, gently dismissed all religion as wishful thinking. Every church he used to quip ought to have a billboard outside with the words on it, important if true. Uh, perhaps he was right, but the pursuit of the sacred, as I discovered long ago, has nothing to do with religion. 
Um, it is not concerned with what lies beyond death. It makes, in fact, no claims on anything at all. The sacred embodies and radiates the glory of what exists in this very moment, in this instant, on this blue jewel of a planet. Before the Buddha or Jesus spoke, wrote D.H. Lawrence, the nightingale sang. And long after the words of Jesus and Buddhists are gone, the nightingale will still sing. The goal of the pilgrim, he added, was to become as if a bird dissolved in the sky, yet filling heaven and earth with song. Think about that image, passing through the sky, leaving no trace at one with the sacred. Well, the sacred is often enmeshed in landscape, and I was fortunate to grow up in a beautiful land called Canada. And I had a series of jobs that only our socialist government could make, including uh, a series of jobs as a park ranger that led me to the greatest wilderness in British Columbia. And my job description was wilderness assessment and public relations. And in two four month seasons, I saw 10 people. So there was no one to relate publicly to. And wilderness assessment was just a license to ramble. And in the course of my ramblings as a young man, I came upon an old native grave that just said, Love Old Man Antoine, died 1926. And curious as to the origin of that grave, I paddled across the lake to a spike camp of a hunting outfit, and I came upon a remarkable man called Atahena, he who walks leaving no tracks, and Gitsan Elder, whose white name was Alec Jack. Now, one of the things that's hard to remember about a place like British Columbia is it's the kind of place we could throw England and the English would never find it. Uh, you know, 400 years after the Amazon had been settled by Europeans, 300 years after Montreal was a thriving city, Europeans had not reached the northwest coast of British Columbia. Until the building of the Panama Canal, it was as far from Europe as you could get. So this Alec Jack... Who, and, and incidentally, in the lower 48 of the United States, the farthest you can get away from Maintain Road is 20 miles. In the northwest quadrant of British Columbia, an area of land the size of Oregon, there's one road. Uh, and, and in the course of these wanderings um, on, with my horse, I found that grave, and I went across the lake and found this man, Alec Jack. He was a remarkable character who had been 43 years old before he had access to and constant uh, engagement with um, white society. His soul had never been crushed in the residential schools. And I pestered him for a long time. I quit my job as a park ranger, hired on as a hunting guide on the condition I could work with Alec. And he was happy to tell me about his trading tr trips to the coast with the dogs, the trade as furs at the Hudson Bay. But of the old stories of the land, he claimed not to remember anything. And then one day, one of our hunters killed a moose, and it was late in the day, so he abandoned the carcass at the head of the lake chain. And I flew in the next morning with a canoe on the float of our plane, and I, I, I dispatched the plane, and then I went and found the kill and chased away a pack of wolves. And then I brought the entire moose carcass, 2,000 pounds, down the river chain to our spike camp. And when Alec, when I got to that camp two days later, encrusted in moose blood because I'd just been sleeping out on the riverside. Uh, somehow he was there with the horses and a sled to drag the meat to the smokehouse to cure it for the winter. And as he saw this canoe filled to the gunnels with um, meat, he suddenly said, I, I don't know, yeah, kind of funny thing. I, I kind of remember, why don't you come by my place tonight? Well, that night in, in a canvas tent with rain falling on the roof, and the flicker of an acetylene lamp, I began to record what would be 30 years of working with Alec, all the stories of Weekett, the trickster transformer, the anthropomorphic figure of Gitsan Lore, the trickster like Raven or Coyote, who taught the people to live by his own folly. And all these stories were of moral gratitude played out against landscape. Um, the animals were alive in these tales. Um, and Alec spoke six languages. English was his sixth, and he spoke it with the care one does speak a different language. 
And he would never say, for example, that you couldn't kill an animal because he killed animals all the time. That's how he lived as a hunter. He would always say you mustn't suffer animals because that was something different. That implied humiliation, arrogance, um, um, a cruelty. Um, and these stories were always whimsical, you know, like the time uh, uh, Wee Cat got his first grizzly bear. The grizzly bear is running through the the willows, you know, and so Wee Cat gets 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 really excited, and he he gets some of that willow bark with red sap in it that looks like blood, and so he goes shooting like the road runner past a grizzly bear. Grizzly bear notices, and Wee Cat goes shooting back the other way, and and uh, and then he comes to a halt in front of the grizzly bear, and the grizzly bear says, "Gee, man, how you do it? Pretty good, pretty fast." And uh, we gets, looks down at the genitals of the grizzly bear and says, well, no wonder you can't run. Look at those goddamn things down there. And then he pretends to cut off his own testicles. And the bear, being kind of stupid, cuts off his own testicles, bleeds to death. And that's how they got the first bear. Or the first swans, like we cat, would go swimming under the water. He'd see all these swans, and he'd take too many of them. The swans would take off, and pretty soon we cat's 5,000 feet in the air. And he thinks, what am I going to do now? And he finally lets go, comes crashing down onto the stone and gets stuck in the stone. And then the link comes along. And, you know, the link's got, when Alec first told me this story, he said, you know that link's got that rough tongue. No, you wouldn't know that, you know. And, uh, but the link then licks the thing away. So all these stories are, 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 are like that. I, and I once asked Alec how long the cycle of Wee Tech Tales was. And he said, a good question. And he had, um, he had, uh, asked his father that in March month, the time of good ice, and they began to walk from one end of the lake all the way to the other, this massive lake, and as he said, all the way there, all the way back, story not halfway done. But here's a marvelous metaphor. To tell the duration of a sacred tale, you must move through sacred geography. You can't simply set a timepiece. I asked Alec what happened when the black robes came, the missionaries, and he said his father was an open-minded man, so he listened to the black robes, and he said, tell me about this place you call heaven. Well, it's really nice. Everybody dresses in white. They've got wings, and they get along with each other. And then Alex's father said, yeah, but what kind of animal you got up there? And the missionary said, no, there's no animals in heaven. He didn't quite understand. They said, oh, so you got no moose. What's a wolf eating up there? Caribou got to be, and it finally dawned on him that heaven was a place you weren't allowed to have animals. He turned to the black robe, the priest, and he said, you got to be out of your fucking mind. You know, you, I can't drink. I can't mess around on my woman. I can't swear. I can't do all the things to make life worth living to go to a place where you don't allow animals. You can forget it. Well, these black robes did play a major role. You've heard about the tragic exhumation of the children's babies in some of these residential schools. My friend Oscar Dennis um, was a victim of one of those um, black robes. Um, he he was beaten. Uh, I showed this photograph. This photograph did many things. Uh, first of all, when it appeared in National Geographic, women from all around the world made a beeline for Iskip, British Columbia. Uh, Oscar once said to me, you know, I, I got this Russian girl coming to see me. And I said, well, Oscar, you just had someone from Poland there last week. I know. I said, well, you don't even speak Russian or Polish. And he said, Wait, bro, they don't really come for conversation. And uh, I showed this. I, I deliberately slotted this magazine article in the National Geographic and made it very unpolitical, nothing about the environment, just a pure celebration of the country. And I knew one day I'd be able to use this photograph because when I went to meet the premier of British Columbia, who incidentally never in his life, let alone his two terms in office, had ever visited a quarter of our province. Can you imagine an American governor who's never been to a quarter of a state? Inconceivable. But Canadians love the idea of the North, but they never go there. And I said to the premier, and I had permission from the family, in the last five years, Oscar's brother hung himself in his mother's basement his other brother was killed in medical malpractice in Prince Rupert. His other brother drowned 10 feet from shore because he never learned how to swim. His sister got an insurance settlement and died on the streets of Prince George. And Oscar's only daughter blew her head off playing Russian roulette with a handgun. Actually, that was a drug hit, it turned out. And I then said to the premier, and in those five years, SK Gold has taken over $1.5 billion of silver and gold out of lands that by every Canadian and British definition of law are unceded territory of the Tall Tan First Nation. 
And I said to the premier, I'd like to know why in Iskit there's not a swimming pool, why there's not a hockey rink, why there are not scholarships for kids to go to school so they can have the same expectation I have. Well, this resistance um, and the rebirth of all of these First Nations in Canada has, in fact, been driven by a sense of the sacred, of sacred landscape. It came to our attention, and I ended up staying in that country in the north, and I've owned a fishing lodge there since 1987. It's not a very viable commercial operation because we charge people based on their personalities, and there's no one we've met that we didn't like. Uh, so it's kind of a marginal thing, but it's a very beautiful place. But in the sacred headwaters, we discovered that the largest corporation in the world, Royal Dutch Shell, had plans to uh, extract coal bed methane over an area of one million hectares. And we had no support from environmental groups. It was very difficult. The land's so isolated. And I wasn't really sure what to do. And I flew in over this valley one afternoon. And by chance, Oscar, my friend, was at the lake that night, along with Gujau, the head of the Haida Nation at the time. And they were around the campfire about two in the morning, and neither man drank but they got into this rip-roaring argument about Raven, like who owns Raven, because the Haida say Raven emerged from a clamshell to steal the light of the sun. The Taltan know that Raven emerged from a cliff face at the confluence of the Taltan and Stikine River, where there's this basaltic formation. And they were really going at each other. You know, you think that Raven would come out of a bloody clamshell. It was going, really going, and I, I didn't want to get involved. Uh, but I, I finally said to the to my friends, they're like brothers to me. I said, you know, I just came in from these headwaters, and you know, I didn't really realize all these rivers, the Nass, the Stikine, and the Skeena, major salmon fisheries, the, 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 the rivers of all of these First Nation civilizations are all born within immediate proximity to each other. And I sort of said, you know, this is kind of a sacred space up there. And that word sacred took hold. But it's interesting because it was only when the word of it got back to the reserve and the women took over the word and they started to call it the sacred headwaters. And then they blockaded the one road of access into that area. And through their sacrifice, they sanctified the concept of sacred headwaters. Had the opposition, the government and Shell, said the obvious, the notion of the sacred headwaters has got to be a white man's idea right? We would have lost. But I also said to my Taltan friends, the minute Shell or the government uses that phrase, the sacred headwaters, we win. And that's what happened. The women resisted. All the nations of British Columbia came together in the headwaters, pouring water from their rivers into a spiritual cedar bucket. And the resistance was all driven, not a single environmental group, only the native people, outfitters, and in the end, we actually faced down Royal Shell. And, and the great moment came at the TED conference in Long Beach when I was able to weasel from Chris Anderson uh, eight minutes to do what you're not supposed to do at TED, which is promote a political idea. And I showed in front of the CEO of Shell for all of the Americas, I showed him the images from the sacred headwaters. And afterwards, there was a... A, 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 a luncheon with a discussion of energy futures that featured him, but the whole conversation was about the sacred headwaters. And afterwards, I came up with a book that we had done and gave it to his wife. And then he said the wonderful thing. He said, I didn't know how beautiful it was. I didn't know how popular, how important it was to the First Nations. And it's just not worth our trouble. And I knew then a year before it was formally announced that we had won and that we pushed Royal Dutch Shell out of the sacred headwaters, and we saved one million hectares of pristine land at the source of all these rivers. But the point, the point is that the notion of the sacred, the commitment to land, that's how we make social change, and that's how cultures are reborn. Since this victory, the entire community of the Taltan has been transformed. The social pathologies have fallen away. And it was the same thing that happened on Haida Gwaii with the Haida, and if you, if you, this is my friend Gujau, who was at the lake that day. And this is another friend of mine, Tom Henley, known as Huckleberry. And 25 years ago, these two men were in a hippie shack on the Tillal River. They couldn't sleep at night. 
They got a road map out of British Columbia, and they simply drew in pencil, drew a line across the archipelago of Haida Gwaii and said, we're going to save everything south of there um, from the loggers. And that line today is, in fact, the boundary of Canada's greatest marine and Pacific pot, Guaihanas, all in a vision and a dream. And this is, this is cultural revival. This is Gujao being, um, being enthroned as a hereditary chief at his potlatch. And this is what was to be the fate of First Nations, slipping away into the soil and dust of our homeland. But this is a reality today, standing up in resistance, fighting for the land, reclaiming a sense of the sacred. And now these communities are thriving as never before uh, with this incredible bright future. And this is a real hope in these dark times that indigenous people are now empowered. Nation states like Canada have yielded to the obvious that these societies contribute to our collective patrimony if we're only allowed to, uh, to accept diversity. Inuit people who a generation ago were on the brink of cultural exhaustion today control an area of land nearly the size of Western Europe, our greatest new territory, Nunavut. So all of this is to say that even in these dark times, we can find the sacred, we can be embraced by the sacred, and in doing so, we find ourselves on healing journeys for the earth, but for ourselves, but also for all of our brothers and sisters around the world. Thanks very much. Thank you.